welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's sponsor brought to you by Early Bird CBD. Go to earlybirdcbd.com. Use the, the code Big Head Pod. Get 20% off your first order. This stuff is great. This stuff helps me sleep at night. Aching joints helps me with that too. Being old athletes, you know, this stuff's great. I love it. And nothing better than chase with a little bit of this Herman Marshall whiskey. So get a chance. This the CBD's got a micro dose of the THC, which helps tremendously so you guys get a chance to try that out so my next guest he's done it all he's been a player a coach a general manager a gosh he seems to be a jack of all trades so none other than the great Ruben Amaro Jr. Ruben how are you today sir doing great Kevin uh jack of all trades master of nothing (laughs) <laughs> master of nothing so you were in the car headed to Cary, north carolina yes indeed my girlfriend uh her son sam sarver is uh playing for the uh hoosiers indiana university of indiana they're playing in the ncaa finals who are they carry uh north carolina we're headed down who are they playing Syracuse Orange. They're playing. Okay, so it's playing the old. They're not in the ACC anymore, are they? Are they in the ACC? Uh, they're ranked. They're ranked. Uh, I think they are in the ACC. That you know, they had a Big Ten, but they're number three going in, and uh, and Indiana was thirteen, I think, coming into the uh, tournament. But uh, they're matching up on uh, Monday night this evening at six p.m. Eastern. Pretty exciting. Were you a soccer guy growing up, or just baseball? Uh. I was a soccer guy, actually, quite a bit. Um, some say that I was probably a lot better soccer player than I was a baseball player, believe it or not. <laughs> but so what Major. So what made you decide to choose baseball over soccer? So for me, it was more, I got an opportunity to be around baseball a lot, obviously, with my dad, uh, having played 11 years in the big leagues and such. But I ended up bat boying for the Phillies from like 80 through 83 and got to be got to be around guys like Pete Rose and Mike Schmidt and Steve Carlton and Larry Boa, a whole ton of great players, Bob Boone. And in fact, my dad was one of the, was a first base coach on that 1980 World Series team. And I think that was the one thing that just all of a sudden was like, wow, baseball's fun, man. This is the, this is the game to play and uh, sort of started putting all my eggs in that basket. So you were so you were a Phillies guy growing up. Born in you're born in, outside of Philadelphia, right? I was born in Philly, Northeast Philadelphia. My uh, my mom was born and raised there. My dad met my mom in Philly. When my dad played there from, I guess it was from about fifty nine or fifty nine. He was traded there from the St. Louis Cardinals the end of 58, the 58 year. And he played there from 59 to with the Phillies until 66 or 65, 65. And then he was traded the Yankees played there at 66, 67. Okay. So you were, so being that, being a Philly guy, you ended up, I think you were going to go into Stanford and playing. I did. You so I did. The other ended coast. Up, uh, go, go playing there four years. I yeah, went up playing in the College World Series and then got drafted by the California Angels, but got traded back to Philadelphia after the 91 season with the Angels. You didn't play with Paul Carey, did you? I sure did. <laughs> he was my he was a freshman of the year that year. But Paul is a he's a beautiful character. He had the biggest home run in the history of Stanford Cardinal, I think. Is that the one he had Ben McDonald? Keep us it was indeed. He was my double A. He was, was my double A manager. PC was a great guy. Oh, was he really? Yep. PC was a. And then his brother was a hockey goalie for the Capitals, Jim Carrey. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Quite a family. Quite yes, a family. it was. Yeah. PC was a big man, too. He could swing the bat, too. So you had large a- human man. He had serious oppo pop. Yeah. And that was back when those bats weren't. They weren't the cheater bats that I was able to use. They were just those regular old East and Silver, Green and Silver ones, weren't they? That's exactly right. Green, Silver. If you were lucky, you got a Black Magic. You know, I don't even know if the Black Magic's even existed back then. 
No, not yet. But we have try and find them. People are selling them for three, four hundred dollars online. So you try and find one of those. So yep. it, yeah, people throwing their throwing throwing. Uh... So so playing wise, and then going to be a assistant GM, general manager, and now into into coaching and stuff. What what did you enjoy the most out of all of it? Wow, that's a great question because I just love baseball. I mean, I grew up with it, obviously, with my dad. I loved every aspect of it. I've done pretty much worn all the hats now. <clears throat> um, never really managed a team, but coached the big leagues level. That was a blast. I got to be with some great friends in Boston when I coached there. Guys like Gary D. Sarcina and uh, Chili Davis, Carl Willis. Um, and catch our manager Ryan Butterfield who was a long time one of my coaching mentors got, I got to be around like when I was coaching it was fun to get back in uniform again I mean there's nothing like playing but it was cool getting back in uniform and basically had that same camaraderie you know that's something special about being in that clubhouse and it was like being in the clubhouse with a bunch of old teammates. It was really fun. Yeah, because I was reading up on you. You were a bat boy in was it was it Cleveland and then or the World Series Phillies and then a I was something about being a bat boy through through different levels, right? It was and then or in the World Series, bat boy in the World Series in '80, and then playing in one, and then and then being a GM for one, right? So that's a pretty interesting statistic to sit there and see that to. To do that, like you said, you to see the guys at and to play and to be a part of a, you know the '80 team in Philly and then the 2008 team in Philadelphia as well. So those that that bunch in in '08. How many of those guys did you, were you a part of the draft process and and bringing them through? Well, most of those guys in '08, I was the assistant GM up until that point. Yeah, and Pat Gillick was the GM. I had worked with Ed Wade. Uh, as the assistant GM. So when Ed Wade lost his job to Pat Gillick uh, and they brought Pat Gillick in, I stayed on as assistant GM. So I did seven years with Ed, three years with Pat. Um, and then uh, I took over after we won the World Series, which doesn't happen very often. Usually, you know, you take over a team that's kind of crappy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I was lucky and got an opportunity to play or to be the GM of a team that was really very good. We did some tweaking and stuff like that. But I was kind of proud of the fact that when we started doing our transition, like some of the guys that are on that were on the team this year went to the World Series, guys like, I don't know, Reese Hoskins and Aaron Nola and Eflin. You know, I was kind of directly responsible for some of those players, which was kind of cool. Um, for them to get an opportunity to now play in even guys like Ranger Suarez. I was part of the, uh, I was a GM when he was signed. And so I was lucky to be able to be part of that as well. So, uh, and now broadcasting for the Phillies. I and mean, that was, that was, that was a fun year. That was a very fun past year. And it looks like they're going to have some good years to come too. Yeah. That with the signing of Trey Turner, I know, uh, Harper's out till they said maybe May with, with the Tommy John and, uh, you know the pitching that they brought in it was one of those things where that you know it was a magical run for them so as a general manager you know seeing that you know we as just you know being a fan but as the, the lay fan that never really played but understands that and sees that you know their first thought is good you got to go get we need this pitching we need this we need this we need this how much do you base I mean you're a Philly guy right so you're a general manager of the Phillies how much of that is is based on the emotion of you of seeing that how close you were and then kind of going out and going all right we need to go get this is, is emotion involved in that or is that just more of a you've got to take a step away from that and take the emotion out of it and make this more of a business how how does a general manager or uh, approach that that's a that's a tremendous question and uh, and because I'm a I was a, a kind of an emotional player and I was an emotional GM and so um, I always believed when I took my job that my job was to try to do what was best to try to win every single year. You know I didn't believe in the whole tanking thing I didn't believe in you know the rebuilding thing and uh, and when we took over we had a really good club we had a great 
core of players, you know, the Utley Rollins and uh, just a whole slew of Cole Hamels and, and uh, you know, Carlos Ruiz. I mean, we had the big piece, you know, Ryan Howard. We had a bunch of great, really great players um, that were still sort of in their prime, but they were starting to go the other way. And, and it's, it, it was hard. We, we, my job was to try to keep it going. And at some point we knew it was going to have to, it was going to end because not everybody can continue, continue to perform at that level. And at some point guys are going to get older and less effective, but, um, but you do have to step away. And then now what I learned through that whole process is that sometimes you have to like step away maybe one year earlier, as opposed to one year too late. And when we started to do that switch over that process, probably a little bit too late, I ended up, uh, you know, we ended up having a couple of really tough years, rebuilding years. Um, but, you know, a lot of it, um, I think the, the organization benefited late years later by some of the trades that we made and some of the transition that we had to do. But um, I think as a fan, as a Philly fan, born and raised, and also as an ex-player, I always believed that it was important for me to have our fans have hope every year. Like, I wanted to make sure that they had something to cheer for, some reason to 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 be at the ballpark and to watch on TV. Um, and I just thought that was part of my job description. Now, they're, in this day and age, you see a lot more teams, you know, that are like kind of sort of in between will, will tank. Um, because they think that's going to be better for their long-term, uh, you know, for their long-term good, right? Uh, for the longevity of the organization and such. Um, I just don't know that that's fair to the fans. I mean, the fans who are going to pay to watch a team, especially in, in a place like Philadelphia or New York, or then you want to try to give them a winning clean team to, to cheer on. So I think there's there's some emotion that you got to take out of it because it is a business at the same time this is a game man and you know it's this is I, I know it's big business now but it's a baseball game it's a sport it's something that fans should be enjoying and i think that that's an important part of the process yeah and you and it, it, i think a lot of it has to do with with the city itself of the blue collar guys that are brought in, right? I mean, those, those, like you said, the, the Utleys that year of the Jason were guys with, you know, just the beards and, and, and that mentality that Jimmy Rollins got. I mean, I'm playing with those guys, playing against them. That, that blue collar work ethic that you saw that in that, this team this year in the, in the, the 2022 Phillies, you, you saw that as far as the, the grittiness of what they're doing. The baseball side, it's that's that's changed so when you so being as a general manager at that point were analytics really involved when you were a gm or were they just starting to creep in and and your and your thoughts on that being a player and a general manager of seeing that and knowing because you know i as as a fan i know that analytics can't take in the fact of what you have to deal with in philadelphia itself i mean the media for one right i mean goodness great the fans too but they're, they're passionate so so as a general manager with with that so what do you think and what are your thoughts on that process well, I mean, I was uh, I was openly criticized for not, you know, jumping on the analytics bandwagon earlier than I was, uh, earlier than I did. I still believe in baseball acumen, uh, instinct, and all those things. I think that there's a lot of information that analytics can give you, but I don't think it should drive your decisions as a baseball person. I think that you're, as the steward of the of the ball club, I think it was important for me to have a uh, like a feel and an understanding of the game. I'm not sure how much that's happening these days, but I think there's a feel and understanding of the game. Okay, this guy is a, a winning type player. This is the type of guy that will fit into what we're trying to do as a winning team. Um, but there's not really an, an analytical piece of that. You can't quantify that analytically. I think that there's a lot of great information that can be provided by some of the analytics, but uh, and, and it's obviously way more in-depth information now than, than ever. That said, I still think that the eye test means a lot. I think that I um, I would not be marginalizing our scouting people um, as much as they are being marginalized now. Um, I do think that there is starting to be the worm is turning a little bit as far as people understanding that 
know, starting pitching is important and you got to get innings out of starters so that the bullpens don't have to be burnt out and cover so many innings during the season. I think that there's roles that players can play speed guys at the top of the, you know, lineup defense means something in the middle of the field and all those things. None of those things have changed all that much. I think some people try to change them, um, but there's, um, and, and I'm not saying I, I would not totally dismiss analytics, but I don't believe that you should be running your organization based on the analytical piece. You need to have people in your organization who know baseball, who understand baseball, and it sets itself apart from other sports um, because it's such so many different intricacies to the game. And I think, uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we get back to that because they're, and I know that the people at the major league level, at the commissioner's office level, and even at the MLBPA level, they, I think that they are feeling that, hey, man, we're not, we're not entertaining the fans as much as we should be. There should be more action and more stuff going on. And I think that's some of the reasons why you see some of the rule changes to try to create more entertainment in the game, more action in the game. And, and, uh, and hopefully the people who understand the game, who really truly understand baseball, and what it takes to win and whatever city and whatever capacity. Um, I think that that's, I, I think that people will start to value them a little bit more than they have in the, you know, in the recent past here with the advent of analytics, having taken over a lot of the decision-making. Yeah. The guys at the lattes and the skinny jeans that show up that have never played beyond little league <laughs> that are making the decision. So, you know, so as a general manager, you know, you're not just only responsible for your major league club, you're, but the guys that are coming up, the, you know, so you're not just, so you're not just building on the 25 guys you're building or your 40 man, you're building on the other, you know, eight teams throughout and knowing what's coming. So, I mean, it's not as if, Really, did you ever really get a break from it other than, you know, the winter, you know, I know right around now baseball shutting down for the holidays, but do you ever really get a break from it? Well, when I was in, in the front office, no. I mean, this is really the only, like, dark time. And even now, I mean, you know, as having been a free agent, your family wants to sign. They want to know where to go. They want to know where they're going to play, where your your wife is got it going Hey man, you know, like, let, let, let's figure this out. Where am I gonna Where am I gonna go play? Where Where are we Where are our kids gonna go to school? There's all types of stuff still going on, but this really was the only time during the course of the season, you know, during the like this one week between Christmas and uh, New Year's, where things kind of shut down. Um, well, when I became a coach, obviously, is a lot different. Uh, you, you're working probably more like eight months out of the year or nine months out of the year as a front office guy, it's basically 365, 24, seven. Uh, it was demanding, but it was really fun. And I never took it for granted because um, not, you know, when you're a GM, I mean, 30 people in the world get to be the GM of the baseball team. And uh, for you to have the privilege to do that, uh, I, I never took that, that uh, role and that opportunity for granted. So, you know, so seeing that, you know, as, as a player looking, we know that the guys in the clubhouse are about the guys in the club when we were playing, right? The front office was just kind of, there was always that line that was drawn, right? That just kind of separated us. Did you, so as, you know, so like I said, you've seen both sides of that fence, you know, what, so does that help in any of the, of the, the, the talks, the conversation you have with the guys is, did that get, come in, get a little bit more respect from the players at that time is because now it just seems like it's all a bunch of individuals on a team, right? There's not, doesn't seem to be a collective paddling in the same direction type of type of teams nowadays, as opposed to when we were playing when, right. If you weren't paddling in the same direction, you were basically going to get punched upside the head to figure it out. So, I mean, so what, you know, seeing that and feeling that, what, what were you able to kind of, you know, sit on both sides of that and see that what were your thoughts on that as far as, as in that, in that situation that you're in? Yeah, I, I have the great advantage of having played, so I kind of understood being sitting in that seat and um, and understanding as a player, understanding what that player was kind of gone through. I, I've been fired a million times, right? I had been released. I'd been taken off the roster. I'd been optioned up and down, like, I don't know how many times. I don't even know what the number is. 
So I felt like I had a really good feel for what that meant. I mean, I, to me, as a player, when I was in the big leagues, I was in heaven. And when I was in the minor leagues, it was hell. It was as simple as that. And I, you know, I, so I had an understanding, at least some empathy behind that. Um, but I also sat on a lot of benches and watched guys operate. I watched the manager. I watched great managers. I watched not so great managers. I saw different ways that I was treated as a player and as a person. Um, and I think ultimately I always believe this, that the best organizations are the ones that set up their culture. They put themselves in a position to set up a culture that is a winning culture. I always believe that as a GM, I am not just developing our organization. We're not trying to just develop like good players. We're trying to develop championship players and championship people. And I think if you do that and you, and winning becomes like the ultimate goal here or, you know, maximizing your ability or your, your not having your players maximize their ability to help win games. I think by the time they're in the big leagues, they understand that. And that's what's expected of them. Uh, and nowadays I think it's become, as you said, I think it's become a little bit more of an individual thing where, people are just trying to maximize their abilities just in general. I just want to be as good as I possibly can be. Well, I think that's important, but to me, it's also, I want to be as good as I possibly be to help my team become a winning team. What can I do to help that team win? And I think that building that culture can start very, very early in an organization. And I think it's something that, um, that organizations have lost. They think that, I think some organizations think that if they just let the individual be as good as he can possibly be, then that's good enough. Well, I don't think that that's the right thing to do. You you play for an organization for the Phillies. In, the, in our case, we said we play for the P or the P on our chest. And I think that that was something that was, um, that was very important to me. And I think it's something that has gotten lost. Now there's some organizations are great. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see some of the perennial uh, organizations who have set this tone, St. Louis Cardinals. And now I see this more with the, the, the Philadelphia Phillies over the last few years. Um, Tampa Bay Rays have always had great uh, development and what have you. Unfortunately, they, they don't hold on to their players all that long, but they do a great job of bringing up players who know how to win and understand and they develop good winning players. Cleveland Indians do a great job. Los Angeles Dodgers do a great job. The Boston Red Sox did a heck of a job for many, many years. Um, and I'm probably leaving out some clubs, but not every single ball club has set a, um, a standard or a culture that is necessary to win. And it's become more and more about, okay, let's just maximize this guy's ability to do, to spin a baseball or to throw as hard as he can or to hit a ball 900 miles. Um, I always believe in trying to set it, set the example or set the tone of trying to create a winning atmosphere. And I think that's why we play the game. Yeah. And these guys that come in, I think you talk about with Trey Turner coming to Philadelphia, of, you know, shunning San Diego for less money to come in. It's one, it has to do with, you think the culture that the teams have, right? Because you know, if he's not chasing that money because he could have gone there and played with, you know, Machado and, and Juan Soto and, you know, those guys, but it seems like the, the, the what like you talk about that what they're building that they're in Philadelphia that that atmosphere that he wanted to and then there's guys there right that, that mentality so they go so so as a GM you're going out for there yeah there's all these free hate we can go spend you know like John Carl Stanton that deal he signed in Miami yeah you're gonna win 60 games with then they paid him 300 million dollars is that you just don't go sign somebody to sign somebody you sign one because it's gonna help your team one two the the city itself too right you, you've got to take that into consideration as well because if you, you know what it's like in philadelphia if you're not putting a good product on the field they are going to let you know right and it's and it's hard to avoid especially with that and with the media so you've got to like you said you've got to build this culture this atmosphere of one winning two of and they as long as are they able to make, be a part of the fan base themselves right because the fans when they're involved with the players it seems like the city and everything goes together. I mean, you know, we've seen it in other sports. So like I said, talk about in Philadelphia, you know, you know, with a hockey team, Flyer with with Carter Hart, that guy, it's 
people are like, this guy's the greatest thing. Yeah, but you don't know what the media is like, what they can do to somebody that age. They can destroy you, right? And it's a mentality, and you've seen it. So these guys come in of knowing, but when guys come into a city, depending as well, right, a lot of these guys, they don't run their mouth a lot. You know, people talk about Bryce Harper when he's in, in Washington. It was always, you know, just, you know, it, it seemed like he was immature. I met when I was there is when they drafted me, came in. But it seemed like when he was there, just the immaturity. But people go, oh, he's this and that. He gets to Philadelphia. Seems to me that his demeanor's completely changed. He's matured into that blue-collar, nitty-gritty, you know, let's go, you know, blood knuckles, let's get out there and get it done. And, and it's taken to that fan base, and they've got – yeah, if he's struggling, whatever, it, they're going to – right? He's, and you know, you know what to say. You know how to handle that media. So as, as a GM, right, do you, you don't just look at, oh, the best ones that are out there. You, you look at the culture, right, as well. Oh, there's no question about it. I mean, you, uh, to me, you look at the makeup of the player and see how he might fit in. Not having having watched Bryce Harper grow up in this game. Yeah, different guy than he uh, uh, now than he was before. I don't think there's any question about it that he's matured. He understands it. Uh, he totally gets what is expected of him as a player. I think mean, he totally ex- knows exactly what the fans expect from him and he is driven to be the best player he can be. And I think that, you know, that signing along with the guys, you know, bringing in a guy like Kyle Schwarber and now bringing in a guy like Turner, you have makeup of guys that are just grinders who are championship caliber players and people. And I think if you, the more guys that you can bring on to your ball club that have that sort of mentality, I think that that plays really well. And you have to also understand, I mean, it's really important to get information from different people. If you haven't had this guy play for you, you don't haven't been in, in the clubhouse with him, you don't really know the guy. And that's why it's so important to have, uh, you know, contacts in different areas, maybe a clubhouse guy, maybe a trainer, whoever, whatever the case may be. May be. Tell me about this guy. Tell me how, how, how does this guy handle it? So a guy like Bryson Stott comes to the big leagues and the reason why they weren't afraid to bring him to the big leagues and to give him maybe, maybe before his time was because he knew they knew that he could mentally handle it. Um, And I think that that is important being able to understand your players and understand their ability to handle the pressure and the negativity that is a, that, that is required and happens in the game of baseball and having guys who, you know, can handle that and the pressure of being in a place like Philadelphia, I think that is ultimately super important um, because certain different cities are different. Yep. You play in Minnesota or you play in uh, Chicago, no disrespect to those fans. They're just not, they're just not as hard and the media is not, is not as uh, demanding. And so it's, I think it's, vitally important for people when and I see it happening because Dave Dombrowski's old school man he knows what he's doing he knows what it takes to be a winning player and he understands the culture because he's been in Boston he's been in Chicago he's been all types of places he gets it and uh, he understands that and I think that's why you're seeing um, him target those certain players and those players targeting their that that, this organization because they know what it's about yeah and you see a lot sometimes these teams bring in nine all-stars that's what they want right but that doesn't that's not that doesn't quantify to winning baseball game you've got to have nine guys that that play well together on the field and and to and to build off of that I mean you look at it and see that's what it seemed to be that but we've gotten away from you know the 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 small ball that we grew up with right you nationally guy watching small ball you know hitters or pitchers getting guys that are bunny I mean we saw a little bit of that in um in the world series a little bit from that but it's still it's still relying on on a lot. I think a guy like like a Trey Turner that at the top of the lineup, are they going to bat him one to be able to set the tone? You know, you talked about when you were in Cleveland, guys like Kenny Lofton, um, you know, Ray Durham. Those guys were – that was their – get on base, right? We, we're playing for a three-run homer, not just a solo homer. Granted, those guys could hit the ball in the ballpark, but – it, gone are those days. The leadoff, the, those leadoff guys. I mean, when you were GM, you had you know you had Shane Victorino leading off, right? Switch hitter guys. Yeah, we had, had Rollins, good, we had Rollins, yeah, Victorino. And, you know those types of we had role players. Yeah, yeah exactly. And and I don't. 
do you, do you see that now? And do you see role players anymore as, as much as you do that, you know, you've got nine guys, okay, they can hit the ball the ballpark, but these team averages are plummeting to, what, the Mendoza line, and it's, and it's awful. What, three guys hit over 300, I think, in the National League or something ridiculous when you were having, you know, 15, 20 of them, or 330, 340. I mean, it's a stretch to, to do that. What, what, what are you seeing? It means for being, from, you know, from watching games, what are you seeing? Yeah, I think the players have gotten so much bigger and stronger. And the ball, obviously, for a couple of years was like basically like a golf ball. So it didn't matter. It could be my size or it could be your size. And you could hit a home run, you know, opposite field home run in, in, in these na- in these ballparks. And I think the, the idea of role playing and getting on base and bat the ball skills and stealing a base and base running and the smaller things that, that uh, equated to winning baseball games started to get marginalized. Um, I do think, and what's funny about that for me is when now all of a sudden you're in a, in a playoff situation, right? Now you got to get a runner to move from second to third when nobody out and the guys can't do it because they haven't done it all year. They haven't done it for the last three years, but now they're expected to do it. I think you're going to see that now that the, you know, the, with the shifting business and, uh, be a, you know, players able to. You know, I have different mixed feelings about all the new rules, but I think you're going to see a little bit more of that. I think you started to see that. I talked to a lot of friends of mine who were scouts who watched a lot of minor league games and, uh, and guys are starting to hit against the shift a little bit more showing a little bit more back control. I don't think the ball is as lively anymore. So, you know, you're not going to be able to hit a home run every swing, every time you miss hit a fly ball. Um, so I think you're going to start seeing a little bit more, role playing i'm hopeful that you know guys will start stealing some bags more and and base running will become a more important part of the game the things that create an excitement for the game and i think that's one of the reasons why they did you know some of the things that they did as far as the bases as far as the shift um and the uh and, and the pitch i guess i guess pitch timer not the pitch clock i mean they want to call it the pitch timer i think all those things are hopefully will will add to some excitement and to much more role play you know certain guys their job is to get on base steal a base score a run that's how they were creating runs another guy was paid to drive in runs gap to gap another guy was paid to turn the lineup over by trying to get on in the eight or nine hole hitter um and so i hope that over time people understand um, and start to value that part of the game because that's part of the beauty of the game. And, um, and, I, and who knows? I'm not sure what the consequences will be from these changes, but I hope that's certainly part of it. Yeah, and it's uh, – I'm not the fan of – you know, you talk about the shift, the biggest thing. These, these guys are – well, I can't do that. Well, we were taught to – like you said, the guys were surgical with a bat. They could, they could do it. You know, Kenny Lofton could shoot a ball inside third base bag if he needed to, right, just because they were trying to play in the pull and doing that. Now, guys, it's like you said, they're not – that they're not even taught to do that. What, what am I supposed to do? Am I even bunning wise guys don't, it's, it's almost, it's a, it's a lost art, right? So as a, a as a, as a general manager, you got we need these guys that you talking about eight, nine guys. Well, I'm not paid to drive in. Your job is basically to get on base so you can turn the lineup over. But no, these guys aren't thinking that way. They're going out trying to hit a home run, taking way too many pitches because they're up there guessing as a, because the analytics say that, that it's going to be this pitch. And you know, then they end up guessing and I mean strikeouts are through the roof um you know they're gonna we'll be at seven man rotations they'll you know your Cy Young winner is probably gonna be a bulk a reliever at this rate right of seeing that so I mean it's <laughs> it, it, and it's but it's I don't know it's it's sometimes it's hard to watch I know so you sit up there in, in the booth and calling a game and watching it I mean it at, at some point what what you know if you're sitting up there do you ever say what's going on this is just it's just not what you're used to or is it just one of those you're trying to make an adjustment to it and just fill the time because some of these games I mean that game in Seattle 17 innings there was what five hits 40 strikeouts I mean what do you talk about this guy's gonna come so try here's to hit a, him run this guy's yeah, gonna so try here's to hit a, him couple, run. Yeah, a couple of things that happened when in 2018 I went from being with the Red Sox in 7, 16 and 17 we won a division we had really electric electrifying players and they played the game the right way and they played the game the win we had jackie bradley in center mookie betts in right Benettoni in left big poppy was our dh 
Um, you know, Bogey was our shortstop. And when the young Devers was, was just coming up to play some third base, I mean, we had a, a kind of an electrifying team and guys who not only were really talented, but understood how to play to win. They would move a runner. They would drive a run in. They would steal a base. They would do a lot of the things that were necessary. And they were still, you know, great offensive players and great defensive players. When I left there in 2018, I went to the Mets. And the thought process there was they had some pretty good players. I mean, they had a young Brandon Nimmo. They had uh, Conforto and some others who were good players. Um, but it didn't seem like they had the right culture and understanding of what it was to win. They were just trying to make their way as, as young major league players. And when I was taken off the field in 2019 and was doing the National League scouting, I was shocked about what had happened to the game because there were a couple of occasions, and on one in particular, where I would watch a ball game and there was not a ball put in play for an hour. And I'm looking around, you know, it was either a walk or a punch out. And no one was putting the ball in play and there were no base runners. I watched it happen like two or three times. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not what this game was supposed to be about. This is not the entertainment that we're looking for. And basically you're looking at guys who are just pitchers who were trying to punch a guy out and a hitter that was trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark. And that was it. And I think, um, you know, the bat to ball skills, the, um, you know, working counts for a reason, trying to move a runner, trying to hit the ball into the, into the four hole to have a guy go first, the third, all like the little intricacies of the game that really made the game exciting. We were getting away from, and that was a disappointing, that was a really disappointing time. I mean, it was enlightening because I, you know, it was obviously the worm and turn. Like, I cannot believe that this is what's happening, but this is what people are valuing, a strikeout and a homer. And I think that um, that, that that part of the game has, had lost its entertainment value. And he, I mean, if you talk to some of the people who were involved, even a guy like Theo Epstein, who may have you know, pioneered some of this in some way, shape, or form, even they now realize, hey, this is not what the intention was. The intention really was to entertain the fans with some, some stuff to cheer, you know, beat guys on base, stealing the base, scoring a run, scoring from second base, scoring from first on a double, um, you know, getting a ground as a pitcher, getting a ground ball in a huge situation to get a double play, you know, all those things we had gotten away from. And, uh, and I think, and I'm hopeful that, uh, that things are starting to turn back the other way because the fans deserve it. Um, it's a way more entertaining game that way. And, uh, and honestly, I'm, I'm hopeful as, as a broadcaster, I like to see action. I'd like to talk about a possible hit and run. I'd like to talk about a guy who might try to drag bunt knowing that that pitcher on the mound is maybe not a great fielder or, um, or a pitcher making a great defensive play and talking about how good he is fundamentally during PFPs and things like that. Those are fun things to talk about. And I think they're also important elements of the game for the entertainment of the fan. And they turn it. A lot of that stuff can turn into a circus. We've seen it. I've watched some of those Phillies games, but ground ball to the pitcher and they're just sailing it into right field because these guys, they don't work on they, What am I supposed to do? So, you know, they went with the universal DH. Now I, I'm, not a fan of it because I grew up, I, I like having two leagues. I did. I mean, when I started playing, you know, they, they had just introduced the interleague side of it. I liked the idea that they had, can, they thought about. So where an American league team would go, we go to Philadelphia, but we play American league rules so they could watch an American league style game. And then if you went to Texas, you would play a national league style baseball. So where uh, you would see the stuff that you wouldn't see. Right. So, so now, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? This universal DH where guys are, because, Grant, there were some pitchers that could hit, right? But now they're not because they're just not being taught at a younger level because of it's just that it's gone completely by the wayside. So, I mean, as a player and as a, what, as a, and a broadcaster, what are your thoughts on that? Because it seems like with the National League game, there was a lot more of that. Bunning, because you remember as a general matter, even as a player, right, we're going to a National League ballpark. The pitcher, they, would, they were doing backflips because they got to take batting practice, right? They were so excited just to go up there. But I know people think, well, it's just another out. 
Yes, it is a lot of the time, but still, it changes the game. It changes the thought process because some pitchers, oh, I'll just groove this, and then one of these guys go up there and just takes a whack, and you know they're driving in a run or something because of well, I didn't think much about it. What are your thoughts on that process as well? So I think one of the things that have, that has happened is because you see so so little action on the field, we devolved the game make this game and that's and that and that's a shame because you know i i also as an old school guy um i love the intricacies and the strategy and the entertainment of having a guy bun a guy over or having a you know a hitter do a you know, pull back the bat and hit, do a hit and run and just do different sorts of things and play the game differently because you knew you had a pitcher hitting behind you. Um, I like that. I think it's gotten to the point where there's so there's just not enough offense going on that I am now sort of switched. I'm I'm accepting of the fact that they were, everybody's going with the DH just because we need more offense in the game. There needs to be more people in it. And if you are, I like, you know, I like the idea of strategizing and doing different things with the pitcher in the nine hole. But as far as I'm concerned now, I mean, we've, we've devolved the game to the point where there's not enough guys making enough contact. And so as a result, we've had to change it just like, like, just like for the same reason now they've banned the shift. It's almost like, well, since players can't do this, they can't control the bat, we're going to make them have success regardless <laughs> of whether or not wherever they play. So we're almost adjusting the game to the, the game to the inability of the players to do something, which I, no, I don't think is the right thing to do um, because I want players to be able to handle the bat. I want a guy to be able to hit the ball the other way. I want them to show that skill set and have that be part of the game because that's also part of the strategy of a game. But um, I, pretty soon, as far as the shift stuff is concerned, I guarantee you, and I said this on MLB Network, I guarantee you you're going to see the left fielder or the right fielder pulled and be placed in like that shallow rover position behind, you know, the first baseman and in between the second baseman. And I think you're going to end up going to two outfielders which is ridiculous for me, that that's actually going to happen. And I, I, I'm almost convinced that this, is, that this is something that may very well happen. And that, and that, to me, is kind of an embarrassment to the game. They'll be out there drawing circles. You have to stay in your circle until the pitch is made. That's what they're, that's what it'll end up doing. So, and I, <laughs> so, I hope that doesn't happen. And I'll, I'll be the guy to say it because it, it, it's almost like we're dumbing the game down so everybody can participate. But that's that's the beauty of the game. There's only been 20,000 of us that played at this le at the major league level, right? The rules have been, you know, that way. There was no – they didn't have a shift back then. Yeah, they, you could do it. Guys would do it. But the problem is – so, you know, if they had the shift, they would pitch to the shift. But now guys can't even they, – they don't even pitch. They just throw. Guys are missing their spots by three feet, not three inches, right? So, you, you know, it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, you know a guy on third base less than two outs, so you're probably going to get something in on your hands, right? So you're looking for it because that's what they're – depending on the, the pitcher, but that's what you're looking for. So, but these guys nowadays, they would miss three feet and throw it behind you, and you're going to score a run anyway. You know, you got guys blocking balls with one knee that are too lazy to do. I mean, it's it's completely it's completely changed, and it's frustrating as anything because it's what are, what are we doing? We're making it's almost like someone's trying to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, I think there, there's a little bit of that, and we're going to be called all heads for this. But uh, but I, I I don't believe the other part of that, and, and I don't know that people you know too many people talk about this, but. When, when a catcher goes to one knee, not only does he have to be super athletic, like JT Rio Muto is like a freak. Like he can do it because he can still move. He has the ability, he has a, he has a you know, uh, quick twitch ability to be able to block a ball. And even sometimes he, he can get a little lazy because he's pretty good with his hands. But there's very few guys you can do it with one knee and still be, you know, prominent blockers. But the other, I, I mean, the other part about this is, Catchers are getting beat up 
because they're getting foul tips off their bodies. They don't have their knees up to block. They don't have their shin guards up to block. You see them getting hit all parts of their body. So their they're uh, likelihood of getting hurt becomes greater and greater because they're so exposed. And so there's a whole slew of different things that I think about as far as some of the things that have changed. Um, and I don't have a problem with like guys trying to evolve or get better or do something different. Um, you said reinvent the wheel. I see that a little bit, but there's also devolving. And, and, and I think there's some, in, in some instances, yeah. Um, there used to be a, a time when, <laughs> when guys actually had to have command and be able to break up the quadrant of the strike zone with their pitches and to be able to get a guy out based on that hitter's inability to handle certain pitches. Now it's just, you know, let me just, most guys, 90, 95% of the uh, pitchers now, or 90% of them are just blow and go. Let me try to spin it as hard as I can and throw it as hard as I can and see if I can make this guy swing and miss. Um, and I'm just hopeful, again, there are, there are times when you want that. There are times when you do want to strike out. But there are also way more times where you want to get two outs with one pitch on a ground ball double play, or you want to be able to jam somebody or pop somebody up with a man on third and less than two outs and get the desired result if you have the infield in. So I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of things about the game that, uh, that you wish still existed. I do think at some point, some of these things will start to be valued again. And I'm hopeful that it starts with, uh, with this year. If you only got to do is watch playoff baseball. And if you watch playoff baseball, you say to yourself, well, what's, what's really important starting pitching and longevity and starting pitching and the ability to guys to handle the bat and situationally hit. So why is it not a port important part of the game for the other 162 games before they get to the playoffs? That should be also emphasized. I think. Yeah, and a guy like JT, he caught basically every day. You don't see that nowadays either. And for him to be, you know, go, I don't know if you want to go glove a silver slugger back there, but to be able to do that, to, what, you know, right, what their oh. body goes through, right? Because you had a guy that would play, you know, catch five days. He would catch, you know, they definitely wouldn't catch on a Sunday for sure, you know, and then maybe on, depending on a pitcher would have their catcher that they had. So, I mean, that those days are gone because guys are going to throw an inning, two innings, and then they're moving on. So, I don't know. It's it's interesting to see where this is all going to end up, um, with just with this the whole analytical side of it. You know, the amount of money they're throwing around at players for 10, 12 years, right? I mean, it's 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 just insane. I mean, I, maybe we should try and find the fountain of youth and come back and play, and we could probably play for twenty years and make one hundred fifty million dollars a year doing stuff to, for the way they're throwing it around for what they're doing. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. What's interesting, you say that um, one of the things that I thought that was sort of one of the mandates was, well, if we bring the analytical part of this game back into it, then we're going to be a little bit more prudent with our money. We're going to have our roster construction. And yet, I mean, more power to them. The players are getting, you know, lucrative contracts in a way that has never happened before especially with the length of the contracts. Now, I, I get it that most guys are taking care of themselves better. The medical stuff is, you know, really, really good. They, they train better. They do a lot of different things. And listen, the, the players have evolved physically even better. But I think there's also, um, you know, there's also, I think what the intention was to, to not have these like long contracts and, and long commitments, well, you know, a lot of uh, organizations have put themselves in those positions to have to do that now because there's more than one organization ready to pay a guy for 10 or 11 or 12 years. Yeah, and you're right, and you're seeing that. It's going to the days of, you know, locking up the younger guys. You, you see that in Atlanta. I mean, you've, you've covered the NL East for a while now with TV, so you see yeah, these awesome. teams in and out with, you know, the, the talent they have, the talent they're producing, and the contracts that they have with these younger guys for five, six years – because they've sent, they've built that culture, and you know, like you said, you see it in Philadelphia now. These guys are starting to to build that culture, but the, you know, and then it 
So and it's it's a model they're trying to follow, and you see it, and it, and it's I think that side of it is great for baseball because one you're ingraining those guys with the fans that are going to be there for longevity, right? Because there's too much turnover, there's too more too much one and dones. Now you've built your fan base to these guys that are part of this family you've created because they're there for five six years, right? They become legends in the city, you know. Philadelphia, those guys, the Jimmy Rollins, the Ryan Howards, those guys be, created this legacy because one they were. A, they were a blue collar they fit that city but and also bringing home a championship as well so i mean that's what teams are trying to create but you're right there are only a few that continue to do it year in and year out and it's um and it's good for baseball but it's sometimes like i said some of these they get tied in these contracts with some longer term deals so you know it's 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 great for baseball it's great for those guys but at the same time you just got to make sure like you said that culture they're all paddling in the same direction yeah, no question. I mean, I, I, I think about those early contracts. The Cleveland Indians really were the ones who sort of pioneering that. Um, I think that they did that very well when with the Jim Tomies and the Manny Ramirez's and those kind of guys, Kenny Loftons, et cetera. They did a good job of locking a lot of those guys up. And, you know, we're in a copycat industry, man. Uh, once one team does it well, then you see other teams start to do it. I'm, I think – You'll see it out of the Tampa Bay Rays every once in a while because they want to have some cost certainty, but it because they have some uh, restrictions as far as their revenues are concerned, they can't do it with all the players, but I think they try to pick out the right guys to do it. They do it with Longoria. They do it with uh, Wander Franco. Um, so they, they pick out certain guys that they certainly want to lock into, but I think you're right. I think the, it's cool for the fans to be able to have a base. I think that that's an important part of it. Uh, that they are uh, players that they can identify with. That was always important for us in Philadelphia. Um, and then that was Ed Wade's um, mantra, who was my very first boss as a GM, that we wanted to get good and stay good. And how did we do that? We built from within with those homegrown players and tried to lock them in and hold them as long as we could, or as long as they were effective players. Maybe well, h- held on to them maybe a little longer than we should have. But uh, But I also think it was it's a cool thing for the players to be identified with the organization and for the organization and the fans to be, to identify with those players. Yeah. Yep. And it's, and that's what you want to build that culture through from the top to bottom. And that's, that's what draws the fans in, especially when those teams are around and they get to see those guys and they can, you know, just watch them grow as an, as a young man, you know, especially homegrown talent, just continue to grow. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the next few years with all these numbers and everything else in these contracts. Um, and see, but you know, you, everything's good on paper, but that's why you play the game. So, like I said, it'll be interesting to see, and we'll definitely have to revisit this down the road at some point, Ruben, and uh, and just see because I always like to have these conversations just to see how it what we talked about and, and where it goes. So, um, but I appreciate you jumping on today, driving down there to Cary, North Carolina, for that for that national championship, and uh, en- enjoy that weather. Enjoy the. It looks like it's cold. I know it's cold, but hopefully it'll be uh, a little bit warmer. A little chilly. Little chilly, but it's going to be right around 45. No, uh, no rain in sight. We don't think, and uh, I think it's perfect soccer weather. So we're hoping that the Hoosiers can come out on top against the Orangemen. But um, uh, pleasure being on with you. Uh, I've known you from afar. I'm sure I played against you at some point, or at least my teams did. And uh, and uh, good luck with your podcast, man. I really enjoyed being on with you. Yeah, get a chance. To- you guys get a chance to see Ruben on uh, is it NBC Sports Philadelphia. Is that what you're on, Ruben? I'm on NBC Sports Philadelphia and doing some stuff for uh, MLB Network as well. So yeah, uh, so that's been fun for me the last couple of years. So perfect. Yeah, you guys get a chance to check out Ruben and uh, see what he's got to talk about. Like I said, during the games and everything else, and check out the Big Head Pod. As, like I said, here on the Dub Network. And uh, like I said, Ruben, we'll do this again. But be safe, enjoy that day, and uh, we'll be in touch, man. Have a good holiday. Thanks very much. You right. as well. Yep. Take care. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you.